Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Thankful that you came to spend some time with us. If you could just scoot real close to the person next to you because uh, we're really crowded this morning and we just need to make some extra room for people. Uh, just kidding. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. We're looking forward to what the Lord's got in store for us today. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're a first-time guest, you should have received a bulletin when you came in. And in the right inside, there's a perforated uh, welcome card. If you will just fill that out, return it to the Welcome Center, and we have a gift for you. And thanks for uh, hanging out with us today. Don't forget, we don't take up an offering in a traditional way, but we do ask you to give. We need you to be faithful in your uh, tithe, offering, building fund commitments, commitments to missions, giving, whatever you've committed to. We have some boxes that are on the wall. You can drop it in there. You can go online to TSWC.org. And you can give there. You can text to give, 740-370-4342. Uh, you, if you've never done that, I would encourage you. That's the number one way that people give nowadays is, is text to give. And uh, once you set that up one time, you never have to put your information in again. You just put in the dollar amount and we'll, we'll reach right into your bank account and take it. Uh, and if you uh, want to uh, swipe your card at the kiosk, we have a kiosk out in the floor. You can swipe it there and give. But please, please, please be faithful in your giving. We, we need you to continue to do that, especially if you've committed to the $7.50 a week club to help uh, offset the, um, the mortgage payment. So we appreciate you doing that. Please, please, please do that. Uh, you notice out in the foyer we have the Help for Hannah, Hope for Hannah <laughs> table. Um, for the t-shirts, we have wristbands, and also we have uh, stickers for your vehicle. Wow. Um, the, you can get the prices, you can get the prices out of the table, but uh, just don't forget to help out um, the, all, the, all the proceeds. Every penny goes to, <laughs> goes to uh, the state and family for Hannah's uh, treatments, traveling expenses, and also food while they're there. Hannah's gonna be sneaking home tomorrow uh, until probably Monday, and then she'll be going back and she starts chemo on Tuesday. And if you're not familiar with the situation, Hannah and her family attend here. Hannah's a year and a half old, and uh, they just found out about a month, month and a half ago that she has um, rhabdoid tumors. Um, and I guess it's very rare, like only 12 cases a year. So if you can um, buy a t-shirt, donate, you can get online and do a search for Hope for Hannah and just kind of follow along in what's going on with her. Get your cell phone out, cell phone, cell phone, cell phone. Come on. I know some of you are like, I ain't getting my phone out in church. Need you to go to TSWC on Facebook. Right now we're, uh, we're doing a live broadcast and we need you to share that. Just like that, you just hit share and I'm going to say share now public and it's done. I'm going to share with you in a few minutes how effective that has been. It's really been awesome that you do that. So get your cell phone, share the uh, live stream that's on the TSWC uh, page of Facebook. Let me just say real quickly, there is a difference there. We have a Tri-State Worship Center page which is a closed group. That's just people that attend a church. Then we have a TSWC page, which is a public group. So if you want to uh, get someone's attention or if you want to direct them to a Facebook page regarding the church, you should direct them to the TSWC page. Uh, because like I said, the Tri-State Worship Center page is a closed group just for people that attend. And, and we talk about things that are related to the church that maybe we don't want out there in the public. Just thought I'd make that difference. Prayer request this week, Kevin Roach, Tracy Rousey, uh, Bill Smith, again, Hannah Staten, Jordan Grizzle, Scott Smith, Mark Hale, Jason Wilson, Troy Brown, Kathy Hughes' dad, uh, Wayne Prim, and Telly Svingus, Vingos, Svingos family. Svingus family. Before we pray uh, on, on Hannah one more time, uh, next Saturday at 3 o'clock at the First Baptist Church in Burlington, uh, Stacy Medcalf, Stacy and Larry, who come see us every now and then. Stacy has a um, event that she does every year uh, called the Cause, C A U S E, the Cause. This year they always find a cause to bring people together to pray, and this year they're going to be praying for Hannah at three o'clock, First Baptist Church in Burlington. I'll be down there. I'm going to lead the prayer, and I'd invite you if you, if you got a few minutes, a half hour, you can come down there at three o'clock this Saturday, First Baptist Church in Burlington. Now listen. There's a Burlington Baptist Church that's in the S-curve. First Baptist is the one that's got the red roof on it. 
okay? That's where Larry and Stacy attend. So if you could come and join us next Saturday at 3, that'd be great. Let's stand. What a great, great, great God we serve. Amen? Amen. I want to uh, encourage you to come back tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about overcoming the mountain of disappointment. Anybody ever been disappointed in life? Ever been disappointed in life? Well, we need to get around the rest of these folks because none of the rest of them have been, just the three or four of us. I've been disappointed in life. We, we need to learn how to get over and overcome. Just move that up just a little bit further, fellas. That'd be great. Pay no attention to the guys with the table. Pay no attention to them. What table, right. Uh, so come back tonight, overcoming the mountain of debt. I want to uh, just take a few minutes before we get into the message this morning uh, to talk about Tri-State Worship Center, to talk about some good stuff and some good things that are happening. Uh, several weeks ago, we switched from doing YouTube Live to doing Facebook Live on our live stream, and we've been asking you to share uh, that, uh, that link on your Facebook page, and I just want to just tell you real quickly what the result of that has been. Just last week, let's just look at last week, uh, we reached a total of 4,500 people last week. I mean, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Not only that, but we had 313 people that were engaged in the video. Now, let me tell you what that means. That means they could have watched five seconds of it and moved on, or they could have watched the whole thing. We don't know, but there were at least 313 people that stopped and looked at that video as you were sharing it. So I just want you to know how important it is for you to share uh, that link every Sunday so that the word can get out. As a matter of fact, I had a few people text me this morning that weren't a, were not going to be able to be here. Uh, but they told me, so we'll be watching it on Facebook. And I, I just think it's an awesome way for us to utilize technology to get the word out. Amen? Amen? Now, let me talk to you for a few minutes about Tri-State Worship Center in the first nine months of the year. Uh, the first graphic I'm going to put up is, is Tri-State Worship Center over a 14-year period, uh, our average attendance and the growth that we have. As you can see, that's a pretty good trend. From, from the first year to, to now, we have seen just steady uh, growth. And, and when you see in 2006 and 2007, a little dip there, really what happened was, is we, we got too big and we were in the building across the street and people don't want to sit on top of each other. They don't want to park right next to you so you can ding their, their door when you open yours. And, and so we saw a little bit of a drop, but then once we bought the building and began to move into here, we see that attendance continue to, to grow. Now, just in 2017, the morning worship, uh, I want to show you what that looks like. And, and if you look at this, what you're going to see is you're going to see we moved into this sanctuary in January, right? So we, we saw some nice increase up through about April. Uh, can, can I just tell you, that's when the new wears off. And all the people that were the gawkers that just wanted to come and see what this was all about, they, they kind of quit coming, all right? And here's the, here was the real problem was when they kind of quit coming, summer hit. Where summer here and summer not. And, <laughs> and so we saw a, a continued decline, if you will, in Sunday morning worship attendance. For the last three months, that's really kind of picked back up and we're probably seeing what the real growth of the church is going to be. In the last three months, we went from 245 to 251 to 258 in the last three months. And so those last three months, you can see that trend going back up. Um, and so the attendance at Tri-State Worship Center is awesome. I think we can do better, obviously. Uh, we still have some chairs that we can put out. We've got 100 more chairs that we can put in this sanctuary. So we can really run about 400 in here before we have to start talking about two services or building something else or whatever the case might be. And uh, that word gets out as you begin to invite your friends and your family and your workmates to come to church. So now let's take a quick look at the finances of the church. Uh, everybody said, oh boy, yes. No, I, yeah, I got one person that said, oh boy. Um, here, here's the deal. Well, let me, let me, let me do this first. Uh, I think the next one is uh, including Wednesday night and Sunday school. Show that one. Uh, that's the morning worship. And then this is Wednesday night, which is the green one. And the red one is Sunday school. And, and I want to brag on Carol Harless, as well as every teacher that we have and every worker that we have. Our, our Wednesday nights have gone from 88 to 104. From 88 to 104. And that's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah I think you should do that. Sunday school has gone from 67 to 101. Now, here's something I need to tell you real quickly. 
A lot of people get really nervous when we start a new Sunday school class. For instance, we started uh, the ladies' Sunday school class in the last month, and a lot of people get nervous because they're like, well, that's going to dry up the adult class. There just won't be anybody left in there. But here's, here is truly Jesus' model of growth. It is to divide and multiply. Divide and multiply. And this has proven it right here because we started a new class and Sabrina Johnson does a, an unbelievable job in here. And that grew the number. It didn't take away anything. It grew the number. And, and so to go from uh, 67 to 101 is just unbelievably awesome. And so I appreciate Carol and, and her hard work as well as Sabrina and starting that new class. Now let's talk about the finances real quick. This next one's going to be really, really busy. And I, I apologize as busy as it looks, but let me just explain it to you real quick. The top line, the orange line is our expenses. That's how much we spend every month. The teal line is the total income, if you will, the total income of the church. And then you break it down into uh, tithes, building fund, offerings, and miscellaneous Building funds, that blue line there in the middle. I have a problem with that line. I have a real problem with that tithe line, and here's why. I don't think your income does that. I don't think your income does that. But for some reason, the tithe dollar went from about 13000 at a low to 22000 as a high. Now, I don't think your income does that, and, and, I, and I'm hoping that uh, maybe there's an anomaly there that we don't understand, but I need you to understand how, how crucial it is for you to be faithful in, in your giving. So that tithe dollar is kind of up and down, and we need to get that on a more steady uh, uh, graph. And then you, you go on down to the green numbers, the building fund, the purple numbers, the miscellaneous, and then the red numbers, offerings that come in. Now, that looks real busy, and, and I... I want to just say this about that graph. I think that graph is awesome. I think it speaks well of you. We've never taken up an offering. Every week the money comes in to pay the bills, except, except in building fund, except in building fund. If you look at this next graph, I want to show you what our goal is, is $6,000 a month in our building fund. Now, if you'll remember back in March, I introduced the $7.50 club. And for two months, we did really good. For two months, we were able to make the payment without borrowing from any of our other uh, funds. But as you can see, after April, it dropped off. And then uh, the last two months, it's really dropped off uh, to the $4,000 range back in, in September. If you've committed to the $7.50 club, we need you to continue to do that every, every week. Uh, again, the best way to do that is reoccurring on, on text to give. Just set it up as a reoccurring offering. It'll, it'll take it out automatically. But it's amazing what about 50 people given $7.50 a week can do to help us offset that deficit. Now, originally, we had to borrow some money from our savings account to make the payment. The last two or three months, we haven't had to do that because there's been enough general fund come in uh, that we had enough money left over that we could take that general fund money and make the building fund payment. But we need you to be faithful in, in your building fund giving. And again, this is just to make the mortgage payment. Here's what happens. When we take money out of general fund to uh, make a mortgage payment, we're really taking money away from ministry to make a mortgage payment. And that's not the way it should go. We, we, we need to make the mortgage payment out of building fund money, money, and then the rest of the resources go towards ministry. And I think that's the way the Lord is pleased with it. And so if you've committed to that $7.50, I would encourage you to please, please, please continue to do it. Let me just give you two more uh, stats real quick, and then we'll move into the message this morning. This next graph kind of shows our total expenses and our total budget. Our budget... Uh, per month is somewhere around $32,000 a month. I know that might sound like a, it is a lot of money, but when you consider all the things that we do, it's really not that much money. When you consider everything that we do, all the ministries that we're involved in, uh, the, the staff that we pay, uh, the building that we have, the insurance, the utilities, all those things, uh, we need about $32,000 a month. And as you can see, the green line or the uh, blue line is what comes in. And, and again, I don't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we spend about everything that comes in. Uh, the expenses kind of follow that line, if you will. The expenses follow the line of the income. If we've got it, we spend it. If we don't, we don't. Someone uh, texted me this morning wanting to know if I could help them with a the bill. And my answer to them was, I'll have to wait and see what the giving is today, and I'll let you know tomorrow. 
And I mean, that's how we operate. Most households, most households operate that way, week to week, right? And the church does the same thing. It's, it's really dependent on the giving as to what we can do to reach out and touch this community. This particular graph, I just, I just want to share this with you because I really want to brag on you. Um, as of September, the income budget, $289,000, okay, as of September. What we've brought in, $269,000. And, and so we've just adjusted our expenses to, to kind of wash that 20 out. But here's, here's the problem is as of September, the expense budget was 288000 and we spent 272000 which is a difference of about three or $4,000. Guess where that was from? The building fund. The deficit in the building fund is what made that number uh, down. And so I, I just want to encourage you, uh, if you're a new attender and you've not attended uh, Tri-State Worship Center for very long, let me encourage you to be a giver. Uh, when we create an environment and an atmosphere of generosity, we can, we can do so much more. If everybody in, in the world that attends church were to give just 10%, just 10%, the income of the church would increase by $38 billion around the globe. You know what we could do with $38 billion? I mean... We could do a lot. Uh, on Monday, we could have clean water in every country. On Tuesday, we could have education for every child around the globe. On, on Wednesday, we could have health care clinics. On Thursday, we could have food for everybody, so forth and so on. And Sunday, we could just get together and celebrate that. And so let me just encourage you to continue uh, to be faithful. Generally, overall, we're in good shape. Now, Mike doesn't like me to say that necessarily, but in, generally, we're in good shape. But where we really need to make up some differences in that building fund, we, we need to make sure we're not taking money from ministry to make a mortgage payment. We, we need to make that mortgage payment separate from the money that's designated for ministry. Everybody with me say, uh-huh? That's all I got to say about that in the words of the great prophet Forrest Gump. I want to move into our second sermon in the series called Timeless. Timeless. In a trendy world, the best things in life are timeless. There are some things in life that come and go, but then there's some things in life that are timeless. For instance, uh, humility, generosity, integrity, courage. These are all things that are always in season, and they not only look good on you, but they look good on everybody. No matter who's wearing this particular trend of kindness or integrity or generosity, they always look good no matter what season it is. But there are trends in life, we talked about some of them last week, that just come and go. There are some things that we call fads. They come and people uh, jump on them, and then it's not long before they go away. But I tell you what, what I found out is that when the fad goes away, if you'll just keep it in your closet, it'll come back. Come on, skinny ties and wide ties and, and never mind. So we talked about last week our view of heaven. What is heaven like? And the reason that we talked about that in this timeless series is because I think when we have the proper perspective of heaven, it changes how we live. When I believe that there's a place called heaven, wherever that's at, it's going to be where God's at and we're going to spend eternity with him as long as we do the right things now. As long as we do the right things now, if I have that perspective of heaven, guess what? It changes the way I live. My life is going to be different. As a matter of fact, I made three different statements about this. One of them was it's belief plus believer that determines behavior. It's what I believe that determines how I behave. There's a stop sign down here at Solida Road and Sand Road right there at the interchange of 52, and there's hardly ever a police officer that sits there. But almost everybody, almost everybody stops at that stop sign. Why? Because they believe it's the right thing to do, so their behavior reflects that. Now, since we're talking about cars for just a minute, let me just say to some of you, and I think it was on, uh, I think Lacey had this on her Facebook months ago, and I thought it was awesome. Some of you need to check your turn signal fluid. Some of you need to check your turn signal fluid, okay? Now listen, don't come up to me after church and say, uh, sorry, brother, but there's no such thing. I know that, okay? Matter of fact, I think we were 
pull, we were getting ready to pull out somewhere and I was waiting and this person ends up turning, especially if you're sitting, coming up the ramp of 52 and there's people coming from the village and you're turning right, they don't turn their turn signal on to get down on 52. And I think I yelled out the window, check your turn signal fluid. <laughs> I thought they needed to. <laughs> Belief plus believer determines behavior. But here's, here's another way to say it. Does my theology shape my reality or does my reality shape my theology? Does what I believe shape my world or is it am I allowing my world to shape what I believe? And, and then I put it a third way and that was like this. Is, are, is your reality shaping your God or is God shaping your reality? And the truth of the matter is if we really believe in heaven then it changes how we behave. It changes how we act. But the opposite of that is when we trivialize or when we make it less important, we make heaven less important. When we trivialize heaven, we marginalize or make insignificant our life. When we say, yeah, heaven might be a real thing, but it's out there and it's in the future and it's a cosmic thing and I don't know. And there's clouds and people standing waist deep in clouds playing harps and choir robes. And that's great. We, when we trivialize it, then we marginalize our life because we're not going to live the way we would live knowing that heaven is a real place that we're going to spend eternity with God and it's going to be based on how we live this life now. And so you were challenged at the end of last week's message to, do, to make one decision, one decision in the following seven days with heaven on your mind. Just one decision. And I hope you did that. But now we, we want to kind of take the turn and get into week two and today's trait that I want to talk about uh, will never, ever, ever go out of style, ever. Today's trait is, is one that, according to what Jesus says about it, will show up in eternity. And he's really, really clear about it. Because not only will this timeless trait never go out of style, it actually shows up in forever. Remember, the best things in life are timeless. It's really one of the reasons why we have to talk about it today. Because it's a thing that will show up in forever. It's a thing that will show up in eternity. And we've got to talk about it. Lord, I thank you today for your awesomeness. I thank you for your awesomeness that's reflected through the lives of your people. I pray this morning that as we have worshipped you, it was a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. But I also hope that it has prepared our hearts to hear from you today. And I pray that as we continue to look at the things in life that are timeless, that you'll give us a teachable spirit that you'll give us a teachable heart that we might hear from you today and that our lives will be different. I thank you for that. I ask it in Christ's name. Someone say amen. amen. I've got to be honest with you. When I uh, know that I, the Lord has laid on my heart to talk about this particular subject, there's a lot of times I want to shy away from a talk like this. There's a time that I just don't want to do this because uh, there's a, it's, it would be easy for you to walk away this morning when I'm done and say, well, that's just what I expected, a preacher to say that about the church. I just expected that. And if you go away and you do that, then I've not done my job very well. As a matter of fact, I hope that we go away this morning believing that the best things in life are timeless. So let me tell you what drove me to this particular point this morning. A timeless thing that will show up in eternity. For example, I don't want you to bump into me in heaven and say... I wish you'd have talked about that, but you really didn't. What I'd rather have happen is for you to bump into me in heaven and you say, man, I'm so glad you talked about it. Not only did you talk about it, but we practiced it. We actually did it, and it really worked. It was timeless. And so I want you to know this morning that I want to set up where we're going by talking about this, the return on investment. Or in the financial world, we call it the ROI. We're going to be talking about what is known as a return on investment. For example, let me give you an example. If you would have invested $990 in Apple computer when they first went public, today that stock would be worth $313,000. That's a really good return on investment. Really good. Now, if you'd have taken that same money and invested it in a company called Webvan, I don't know if you remember who Webvan was, but they were going to bring your groceries to your door. This was back in the 90s. If you'd have taken that some, same money and invested in Webvan, web van, your money would be worth nothing because they went out of business. That's not a very good return on investment. 
Apple, good return on investment. Web van, not so much. And if you've invested in them, you want to see that return on investment. You don't want to see a zero. You want to see some kind of a return in the investment that you're making. Now, if you've done any kind of financial uh, searching at all for your 401k or your retirement, uh, we, we hear that term, return on investment. In fact, the financial world promises us a great return on our investment, but they always have this little saying. There's this one little disclaimer. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. You've heard that. Oh, if you invest in this, it's going to make you so much money. But now we need to remind you, past performance does not necessarily guarantee future results. And when it comes to financial investments, we always hope for a great ROI. We always hope for that great return on investment. But there's always a chance that it's not going to work out. I know there's people sitting in the congregation this morning. You've probably invested in a business or in your own business. Things didn't work out very well. You didn't get a good return on your investment. So what are you going to do? You're going to just lay down. You're going to stop. But here's why I bring it up. Today, we're going to talk about the greatest financial advice I could give you. Aren't you glad you came? Yeah, both of you. I'm going to give you the greatest financial advice that you will ever receive because today we're going to talk about the greatest return on investment that you'll ever get. The financial advice has a strong history. It has a strong past. It has a great success. And the past is an indicator of the future results if we just do it, if we just obey it. And this is the best financial advice you're ever going to receive because not only does it impact today, it's going to impact today and tomorrow and forever because this financial advice that I'm going to give you this morning is timeless. I don't know if you've heard this yet or not, but the best things in life are timeless. This financial advice doesn't really come from me. This financial advice, as you probably have figured out by now, comes from God. There's some financial advice that he gives us, and to understand how to apply this advice, we're going to eavesdrop on a conversation that God is having with the children of Israel. We're going to listen in on this conversation that's in the last book of the Old Testament, the book called Malachi. And I got to warn you, it's a pretty tense conversation. It's a pretty intense conversation, and we're going to, we're going to listen to the conversation, but then we're going to hopefully learn from the conversation, because in this conversation... God gives a command and an invitation. He gives two things in, in this conversation that we're about to read in the book of Malachi. He gives a command and he gives an invitation. And as we're about to discover, this command was not just reserved for Israel, but the command is for all of God's people. The great news is that both are offered to us as well, a command and an invitation. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Malachi chapter 3. We're going to start around verse 7, and we're going to hear some good, sound financial advice from God. Starting at verse 7, Malachi chapter 3. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Look at me for a minute before you read the rest of it. God is pleading with his people. God is pleading with his people, please return to me. And Israel's response really reveals that there's a problem. There's a problem in this because they didn't know they had left him. God's saying, please return. Israel's saying, we don't really understand because at the end of verse 7 there it says, but you ask, how are we to return? Why, how do we return when we don't even know we've left? And this describes the state of a lot of believers in the world today. How can we return when we don't really even know that we've left? And God's response to the question turns up the intensity, ratchets up the tension when he says, will a mere mortal rob God? The children of Israel ask, how are we mere mortals robbing you? How do you rob God, the one who created the universe and spoke things into existence, said, let there be and there was, and formed man out of the dust of the earth, and then breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and he became a living being. How do you rob God? 
And God gives us the answer in verse 8. In tithes and offerings. In tithes and in offerings. But God goes a little bit further. He said, because you've been robbing me, and the way that you've been robbing me is through my tithe and the offering that you offer, he goes on to say, you are now under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me. I hope you're getting the picture. Now listen, if you're a first-time guest with us today, I'm so thankful that you came. I really am. I wish you came last week. But I'm glad you're here this week because this applies to all of us. God is in this conversation with Israel. He said, you've left me. I want you to return. They said, we don't know how to return because we didn't know we'd left. He said, you left because you're robbing me. How can we mere mortals rob you, God? He says, you robbed me because of the tithe and the offering that you're keeping. And because of that, your whole nation is under a curse because you're robbing me. And then this conversation begins to shift a little bit and God begins to show his love. He begins to show his care. He begins to show the potential of what can happen when we put God first in our financial life. And he says in verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. How awesome it would be for somebody at Tri-State Worship Center to be able to stand up and say, no more, I can't take it. (laughs) You've just poured out so much blessing on me, Just, just give it to somebody else. Now, I've been the pastor here for 14 years, and I haven't heard that, not once. So to recap, this conversation that God's having with his people and with us this morning, we have a command, and we have an invitation. First, the command from God. This is the command. Don't rob me of tithes and offerings. Don't rob me. That's the command. The invitation, the invitation is, test me. This is our version of I triple dog dare you to do it. The only place in the Bible that we're told to test God is in the arena of our finances. The only place we're told to test him is in the arena of tithe and offering. And here's the pushback. The number one reason that I get when I talk to someone about tithe and offering is this. I hear this. Here's the pushback. Are you ready for it? Well, you know what? If I made more money, I could give more. If I made more money, I could give more. In other words, here's what we're really saying. Well, you know, we're all generous. And if I made more money, I would be more generous. Because if I made more money, I could give more. And that's interesting. But the research that's been done on this may show something different. Let me put up this graph to show you. It shows income levels. Income levels of 25,000, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, so forth and so on. Now, that's how much money people would make. And let's look at how much money they give. The people that make $25,000 or less, they give 7.7%. Now, look at me. That's not 10. But it gets worse, doesn't it? The next group, 25 to 50, they give 4.8. 50 to 75, they give 3.5. It's getting worse. All the way down to 200,000 plus, they give 2.8%. So while the theory sounds good, that if I made more money, I could give more money away, the reality is the more money you make, the less money you give away. Why is that? Why is it that the more money I make, the less I give away? What is wrong with this picture? Well, Vicki, can you come and help me? I would like to show you a little illustration this morning on why this is so. Now, listen, if you're hungry this morning, you came to the right place because we got pie. We got pie. Sorry, Robin, I didn't buy this from Snack Shack. I'm sorry. Those of you who don't know Robin Shepard sitting in the back row with Melody, and I'm not looking because she's going to be upset with me. I didn't buy these. I bought them at Walmart. I'm sorry. Kay is back there as well. 
Here's what happens. Here's what we do is, is this pie, this pie represents our income. Everybody see the pie? Everybody get hungry? Yeah. Mm, I knew you were, Jonathan. So here's what we do. We take the first slice of pie out, and what do we do? We take the first slice of pie, and we pay our mortgage with it. Okay? Lovely assistant, Carol Merrill. <laughs> She's going on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, very nice. Mmm. Man, not as good as Snack Shack, but it's still pie. Second, the second slice is for our kids. We have to put aside some money for our kids, for their clothes. And, and then you know what happens? What happens is they grow up and they move out, but then they move back. <laughs> right? Then we have the third slice of pie, and that goes to our utilities. We've got to pay our power bill and our water bill and our gas bill and trash pickup and Armstrong and internet. And yeah, you get the picture. So we, we have to pay our utilities. I'm going to swing around this other side. And then the next piece of pie we get, we, we have to pay for, I think this is going to be our car. Yeah. Our car, or in some cases, two cars, or in some cases, three or four cars, and we've got to, we've got to pay for the car. And then we get another piece of pie, as Carol Merrill is getting for us, and we've got to buy groceries with it. I'm sorry, you can't see over there, can you? Here, let me move this back. Can you see it now? Groceries, so we, we get some groceries. And then we get another piece of pie, and we have our savings account. Some people laugh, say, savings? What's that? And then we have this other piece of pie, and we're going to do debt reduction. We pay $10 on debt reduction. And, and here's, what we, here's what happens. We say to God, we give you what's left. We just pour the crumbs in, in, Lord, and just give you what's left. That's why if we make more money, stay right here with me, honey. Your hair looks great. And I'm not... And I'm not teasing. Uh, this is the problem with people say, well, if I made more money, I'd give more money away. If I made more money, I'd be more generous. No, we're not more generous because of the prioritizing that we have of our money. This is the wrong priority. This is wrong. This doesn't work. It can't be this way. As a matter of fact, if some of you want, you can come up here and get you a piece of pie real quick. Jonathan, I know you want some, so here, you can have that one. Uh, anybody else going to be brave enough, or is it just Jonathan, the only one brave enough to come and get some pie? Oh, it's the children's household that's coming to get the pie. <laughs> Dale? Yeah, I said that anybody else? Anybody? There, my man, come on. I got two more pieces to get rid of before I can go to my second illustration. Three more, I'm sorry, Michael, Barry Mann. Come on, somebody come and get it. Come on, Kay. Ramonda. Look at this. I'm serving you for a change. Kay's normally serving me. There you go. Don't get that everywhere. Hang on. Wait a minute. Don't go nowhere. We're going to do a second pie. Stay right there, okay? Oh, wait a minute. Look at that. Ramonda's going to give you. Oh, that's generosity right there. The reason that people give less, even though they have more, is because they are prioritizing their giving, and they're giving God just the crumbs that are left. And can I tell you something? Listen very carefully. God is not satisfied with leftovers. He's not. Now, remember I said I get real shy and nervous about having these kinds of messages, because I know here's how the breakout will happen. The people that give and prioritize their giving the right way, they're cool with this message. Oh boy, I did it just then, didn't I? And the person that's going, man, I hate it when he does this. That's usually the person that struggles with their giving. I'm just being honest about it. Because we've got it out of whack. We've got leftovers that we give to God. And so let me show you how you should prioritize your giving. I have a second pie. Jonathan, I kept track that you already had yours. And who do you think the first slice should go to? God. So we're going to give God his slice right off the top, right? We're going to do that. And then we're going to give God, or we're going to give a slice to the mortgage company. Somebody say, you mean give to God before I give to the mortgage company? Listen to me. God's the only one that's promised to bless you for giving to him. 
He's the only one. You know what the mortgage company's promised you? The mortgage company has promised you that they'll show you who owns your house if you miss a payment. They haven't promised to bless your giving. They haven't promised to bless your life. God has promised so we take care of him first. You're loaded up, aren't you, honey? Then we take care of the kids again. Them kids. Oh. Then we've got to take care of our utilities. Come on, Carol, Meryl. I know your name's Vicky. after 39 years. After 50 years, a guy was talking to his buddy. He said, Man, I just love all the pet names you call your wife, honey and boo-boo and sweetie. And he said, I just love the way you do that. And the guy said, I'll be honest with you, I forgot her name about 10 years ago. <laughs> go ahead. That's for the groceries. I'm just going to go ahead and turn these over. And in some cases, you get a second car. But only after you take care of God. Only after you take care of God. Why? Because the priority of giving has to start with God. It can't start with everything else. You can't just leave the crumbs for God. Now, who wants some pie? Come on, get some pie. Jonathan, just stay where you're at. Ramonda, thank you for giving. Payson wants some pie. Oh, Payson, here, let me give you that, okay? (laughs) Yeah, I wasn't... See how when we're giving it away, everybody wants it. One more piece. Got one piece left. Anybody want it? It's free. It's your tithe dollar at work right here. No, the truth is I bought the pies, okay? You didn't buy the pies. I bought the pies. Here you go, Kristen. You look nice today. Thank you, Carol. Meryl. Here's what I'm trying to tell us this morning. You start with God first. You give, listen, you don't give him a tithe. What did that scripture say? Bring the tithe. Why? Because it belongs to God. It's not even ours. The tithe dollar belongs to God. You bring a tithe because that's what belongs to God. You give an offering that's over and above the tithe. But that's not all. I know what you're thinking. Man, you've you've emptied my bank account already. Where else can we go with this? Listen carefully. There is a principle known as the principle of first fruits. I'm not a prosperity preacher. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's not just tithe that's being a tenth. It's tithe as the first fruits. It's the first tenth. Of what, it's not what you've got left over. Before you pay the mortgage, before you pay the power bill, before you pay your grocery bill, you bring your tithe to God. And where do you bring it? To the storehouse, to the church. Well, I support brother so-and-so down there in Raleigh, North Carolina. He blesses my heart. You call brother so-and-so when your daughter needs to get married or when your parents need to be buried or somebody's in the hospital. You call brother so-and-so in Raleigh and see if he'll come and see you. I think you need to bring the tithe to the storehouse. You want to send brother so-and-so five bucks in Raleigh after you've taken care of the church? Fine. Do what you want to do with that. But the first fruits, the first tenth, the first tithe has to come to the church. Well, then what is an offering, pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. An offering is whatever you want to give above the 10%. It's whatever you do that's above that. And here's the challenge. Here's something that's really going to smack some people just in the wrong way. If you've been a Christian for, let's say, 10 years, and you're still just giving 10%, you need to check yourself. You ought to check yourself. Because the longer I serve him and the longer he blesses me, the longer he takes care of my life, guess what I want to do? I want to increase my giving. And I'm not asking you to do something that I don't already do. You're more than welcome to go ask Mike Stevens what the pastor gives as long as he can tell me what you give. I love you. I'm not asking you to do something I don't do. And can I say this? From the very first day of our married life, I've never just given God 10%. Never. Never. I started at 15%. The first fruit, the tithe, the 10% was, 
was the offering that, or the tithe that belonged to him, and the 5% was the offering that I gave over and above that. Matter of fact, this, some of you may, may uh, poke fun at my theology right here, but at one point in time, me and God were on a sliding scale. We were on a sliding scale. I said, Lord, the more money I make, the, the higher percentage I'll give back to you. There was at one point in my life, I was given 35% of my income to the church. 35%. Why? Because the Lord continued to bless me. And I was going to honor my promise to him because he was honoring me. Now, that hasn't been since I've been in the ministry. That was when I was working for the man every night and day. And I was rolling, rolling. Never mind. So again, the only place in the Bible that we're told to test God is right here. God says, I triple dog dare you to try this formula. Because here's what God's really saying. 90% of your income with his blessing is worth more than 100% of your income without his blessing. Because he can do more with a dime than you can do with a dollar. So where do you start? Where do you begin? Maybe you're here this morning and you hear this and it doesn't sound like the freedom that's supposed to come in the church. It's not about freedom. I don't feel free. I feel pressured now. I feel guilty. Listen carefully. If you don't know where to start, let me encourage you, number one, to come back next week. We're going to talk about financial freedom next week. And I'm going to talk about how you can get rid of those feelings. Because maybe you're in such a financial pressure situation that giving a slice of your income to the church just seems impossible. We need to talk about that, and we're going to start on that next week. And so I would encourage you to come back. But you're here today. What do I do today, pastor? What do I do right now to begin to correct this situation of bad priorities in my giving? Give something. Give something. See... Someone said, another pastor of another church in South Point asked me, said, do you think you'd get more giving if you passed the hat? And I said, you know, I don't know if we would or not, but we're not going to do that because we've never done that. We want people to give. We don't want to take. I'm not here to take something from you. I'm here to give something to you. And that is God's blessing in your life when you handle your finances the way he said to do it. But here's our problem. Our problem is, is that in our younger years, usually when we get married, we buy things that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people we don't like. And then once we catch the Joneses, they refinance. And then we consolidate and we start all over. But can I tell you something, that pressure that you feel, that intense pressure that you feel, I want you to know God understands that. God's not mad at us. He understands it. He wants to help us get through it. He wants to help us navigate it. And that's why he says, test me. Try it. You'll like it. As a matter of fact, if that's not reason enough to come back next week, here's one more. And this might be the biggest reason because it's our bottom line. This is the takeaway today. This is your tweetable moment. When you become a caretaker of God's kingdom, God becomes a caretaker of your kingdom. When you become a caretaker of God's kingdom, he becomes a caretaker of your kingdom. And as good as you might be with a dollar, I guarantee you he's better. As good of a caretaker as I feel like I am with Vicki and Mai's financing, God can do so much better, so much better. And when I become a good caretaker of his kingdom, he becomes such a great caretaker of my kingdom. And we find that out when we learn his way to do things. How do you start? Well, Linda, you better come play something really, really fluffy to make him feel really, really good. Listen, yeah, those of you that had pie, you probably need a nap. Just take this sermon and listen to it. It puts everybody else to sleep. It'll probably work for you too. How do you start? How do you start by being a good caretaker of his kingdom? Here's where you start. You start with tithing. Somebody say, well, that's not a New Testament principle. I beg to differ with you. Go read chapter, uh, Matthew 23 when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. 
And he says, you're real careful to tithe on this and this and this, but you have left out the widows and the orphans. Jesus said, continue to do what you were doing, but don't leave the widows and the orphans out. He, Jesus himself said, keep tithing. And you can read in the New Testament, there's at least 10 other scriptures in the New Testament talk about tithing. But you know what? If you don't want to call it tithing, don't call it tithing. Give 10% of an offering, okay? Start somewhere. Start somewhere with giving to God. And when we do that, he will become a caretaker of our kingdom. Now listen carefully. It starts with tithing. It starts with knowing that God understands where you're at. He knows where you're at. He's not mad. He wants to help you. Don't shy away from it. This is personal. This is hard. This is scary. I understand that. But that's why God says, trust in me and then test me. Test me and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and throw out a blessing on you so much you can't even contain it. It's why the best financial advice that you'll ever receive is found first by investing in the kingdom of God. That's the best financial advice you'll ever get because it will impact your life today and tomorrow and forever because this financial advice is timeless. It's timeless. So let's give Jesus the last word this morning. You ready? Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. He says, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where the thieves do not break in and steal it. Jesus said, invest in the kingdom because that's what's going to last forever. And I would just encourage you, don't miss this opportunity today and come back next week so we can talk about financial freedom. But we start by saying, God, I want to be a better caretaker of your kingdom so that you'll be the caretaker of my kingdom. Stand with me. Lord, thank you today for your awesomeness. Thank you for being such a, an understanding God that even in those times when we don't feel like we can be obedient to your word, you help us. You help us by saying, test me. You help us by saying, come on, give it a shot. And so this morning, I pray that there'll be some boldness and some courage by some folks by bringing to you the first fruit tithe. Bring it to you because it belongs to you. It's not how much money will I keep for myself, but how much of God's money will I keep for myself? Because it's yours. And I pray that as we begin to understand that, as we begin to become better stewards of what you've entrusted to us, that your kingdom would be enhanced and that we would be better caretakers of your kingdom and in turn you become a caretaker of ours. So help us this morning as we wrestle with that. We thank you for that and ask it in Christ's name. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. I know this was a message on giving. But the only reason that the church exists is to, to finish the uncompleted work of Christ, the unfinished work of Christ, which is to seek and save those who are lost. The reason this building is here is to reach to the outside and touch the unchurched and somehow, some way, bring them this good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it will touch their life and change their life and change their forever. We do that because of the resources and the funding of the people of the church. But the reason we do that is to keep touching people that need to hear the good news. So if you're here this morning and you're not in a right relationship with Christ, I am so thankful that you came. But I'm going to ask you right now to make a decision. That decision is to believe on him. The Bible says if I will confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, I can be saved. And that's a decision you'll have to make. So I'm going to ask the praise team to sing this chorus through just a couple times. As they sing, if you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, I'd love to pray with you. Come on, don't wait. I, 
I know that when you start talking about giving, you're really touching people where they live. And I know that. And God knows that. And the best thing we can do is to create an atmosphere of generosity. And when we do that, the church is able to do so much more. So I'm not asking you, listen, I'm not asking you to give more so that I can have a raise. Not at all. I'm asking you just to be faithful to God so he can bless your life. I don't want something from you. I want something for you. And it's been proven in my own life. I could, I could give you testimony after testimony after testimony of how God has blessed my life. And I know it's a direct result from my obedience in giving. I used to be the taker. I used to be the consumer. But I learned quickly what it is to be the contributor. And when you become a contributor, when you become the giver, he blesses your life like you wouldn't believe. I, I wish I had time to share the stories. I don't. But if you pick up my book, The Sovereignty of God, there's a couple stories in there about how good he is. It's a great book, all 75 pages of it. Um, and it's only like this big. So, and it's spiral bound kind of thing. It's cheap, huh? No picture. Sorry, Jonathan. Listen, how do you start? Number one, start with a tithe. Number two, understand that God understands. Number three, come back next week. Come back next week. Remember, my request to you was to prioritize your calendar. Be here for the next three Sundays, starting last Sunday, today, and next week. Come next week. We're going we're gonna to take it just a little bit further. I love you. I love you. Whether you believe it or not, I love you. And uh, I just encourage you to be faithful to God so he'll be faithful to you. Amen? God bless you. See you tonight at 6, overcoming the mountain of disappointment. Bye.